<gasps> Blog Talk Radio. How come you don't get that? You never used. You always used to get that. <gasps> Blog Talk Radio. <laughs> anyway, um, good evening, everybody. I hope you're all ready and willing, in the nicest possible way, for her Panwo Radio. Now, some people had a few problems with the new system, but it's not to worry. It's just as simple as the old one. You've just got to get used to it. So I'm going to give you a moment to refresh your browsers and, of course, refresh your ears and refresh your minds like you always do. And then we're going to begin. So, with no further ado, let us proceed. You're listening to Critical Mass Radio. Now, it's our turn. And welcome to her Programme 21 of her Panwo Radio. Hapanwo stands for Hospital Porters Against the New World Order. Tune in for all the latest news, views and reviews from the world of government cover-ups, ghosts, UFOs, hospital porters, paranormal investigation, hidden knowledge, forbidden history and archaeology, chemtrails and more hospital porters. I am Ben Emeline Jones and this show is intended to be a companion to the Hapanwo blog and Hapanwo TV YouTube channel. Now that song was Jump by Van Halen. I've always loved that, you know. It takes me back to when I was kind of knee-high to a grasshopper. It's, um, honey, I just love songs from that era. Uh, well, it's, as I say, it's Programme 21. Programme 21, a Panwo Radio comes of age. Could you believe it? We're just crawling around the floor and suddenly now we're big strapping lads, eh? <laughs> In Programme 18, we could drink. Now we're 21. What can we do? Well, we'll find out, won't we? Now tonight, we're going to be asking the question, all you listeners out there, could you be a sceptic? Are you a sceptic, but you just don't know it yet? You know, you might be a kind of a latent sceptic who has not yet come to terms with your true nature. Um, perhaps you're a secret sceptic, and you do secret sceptic things in secret with other sceptics. You know, you, you all go into dark and cellars and watch James Randi DVDs. And, you know, and you, you haven't yet come out of the closet to your family and friends. Now, if the answer to any of these questions is yes, then it's confession time, folks. Let us know if you're a sceptic. Don't worry, we will treat you with kindness and compassion. You are among friends. Now, uh, there's a feeling in popular culture, now even amongst those who have no interest in sort of paranormal or conspiratorial matters, or spiritual matters, and that it sort of holds the sceptics in very high regard. Um, all mainstream TVs, you know, they have a sceptic on when it comes to... Um, when it comes to these subjects, um, they're kind of sometimes seen as the kind of pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You know, um, if you if you have a ghost, you have a UFO. Well, can you convince the skeptics? If you can do, do you've won the ultimate prize. You know? But the thing about it is, how many of the people who say things like that and hear things like that know what a skeptic is? You know, why are skeptics seen as so important and so authoritative? I have discussed this before, especially in program five of a Panwo radio, which you will find on the archives of this. But um, to address these issues in more detail, I've invited a man called Steve Trueblue to come onto the show, and he's our guest for this evening. He's a Gnosis teacher, a filmmaker, and a researcher from Australia, and he's also a very committed analyst of the sceptic movement as a social phenomenon. Now, some people, you might have known him on YouTube because he's got a very popular YouTube channel called Kimbo99, and he's got some excellent videos on there. I do recommend you go and see them. Right, um, we've also, we're all going to be talking about other things as well, such as it's Military Religion Day. We've got Darren Brown. I mean, that's postponed from last week. We had, um, we did have him, but um, I didn't have time to say it, so we're going to go through that. We're going to go through all the latest news, space weather, all kinds of other things. And naturally, the very best music, like this. Hospital, Hospital Porter's Pride, Pride and Dignity, dignity. Stop, Stop the New World Order. order. Welcome, Welcome to Panwo Radio. Radio. Uh, and that song now was You Take Me Up by the Thompson Twins, one of the greatest bands and one of the greatest songs. And I loved that one as a kid. We used to, we used to try and sing it at school, you know. There's hope in his eyes. <laughs> I must play some more of their stuff. Um, and it's strange, you know, I, I tend to actually play the music I used to listen to when I was a kid. And I wonder why it is music from our childhood always sticks in our head more. I've never quite worked that out. But it is always the case for everyone I know. They love the music most that was around in those days when they were that age. Now, um, if you want to contact me, <clears throat> you can talk in the chat box. And we've got some good people in the chat box tonight. We've got Lisa and Paul 
as usual, hello, and George, Reverend Wawa, he's, we're going to hear us, he's actually been a great help to me, and we're going to hear some more of his work in the, in the next uh, little while, and um, Decker is back, Decker who uh, is a good friend of mine from, I've met several times, good to see you again Decker, now, if you want to talk to me, you can always talk to me through through the um, chat box, but um, I have an email address too, and um, that email address is hapanwo at criticalmassradio.co.uk. And if you want to talk to me, you can always send me an email at that address, and I will read it and um, maybe read it out in the air with your permission if, if, if it's um, if it's relevant, if it's good. And also, there's also something called the Hapanwo Forum, which is um, you can find if you go to the Hapanwo blog. Um, it's actually on the links column, and that's Hapanwo Forum, all one word. Dot freeforums. Dot org. Now, um, I've got to say a little word now about advertising because um, I've come, got a little request for people because now um, the Critical Mass Radio is actually a highly successful station. It's only been open a few months, but listening figures are high and they're rising all the time. And every, you know, all the time I meet people who've heard the station and they speak very highly of it. Now, if you have a product you'd like me to advertise in exchange for a reasonable fee please let me know and uh, you can contact me using the above methods which I've just described now um, I should point out I'm not doing general advertising I'm not willing to advertise any product and I don't think the station would would um, probably allow that either it must be appropriate now um, and I know there's some alternative stations that have general advertising and um, I really I, I'm I really don't like those, and I've got no intention of ever getting involved in that. There's nothing worse. You're having a discussion about Monsanto and Codex Alimentarius, and then they say, right, we're just going to take a break, and what do you get? <laughs> I'm loving it. I uh, don't want anything like that. So do let me know, and um, you know, do let me know if you have a product, a book or something. I've, um, I have tried advertising a product a little while ago, but it's um, that's on the back burner. But there's always more coming along in the future. Hapanwo Radio News. Right, uh, last week I had to drop a news story because um, um, we didn't have time, but uh, this week I'm now going to go into it. This is about Darren Brown. Now, um, I don't know how many of you saw Apocalypse. Um, Darren Brown, now, most people know who he is. He's this famous media illusionist and he's a hypnotist. And I've written about him before because he's a skeptic and we're going to go into the subject of skeptics. Um, this today and the fact that this guy he supposedly exposes psychics and spiritualists as fakes now I don't agree that all psychics and spiritualists are fakes but um, that's a big subject and we can't go into now but um, <clears throat> that's because it's not really relevant to this particular field of what Darren Brown has been doing now um, he's very well known for designing sophisticated psychological and hypnotic experiments which usually involve placing ordinary people in a very unusual situation and he uses stagecraft psychology and hypnotic power um, to sort of like create kind of experience for them and there's been programs like you know messiah seance the heist he's done about a dozen of these programs now if you go to last um to, you know the week before last we had on um neil sanders Sorry, last week, yeah. Now, me and Liam Sanders discussed a lot more about uh, Darren Brown. But his latest show is called Apocalypse, and it's a very, very strange blend of The Truman Show, a George Romero film, and Jeremy Kyle. <laughs> I mean, this, this is kind of was... All his shows sort of like try to hook into the reality TV genre, you know, but um, this one goes way further than any of his others, and it might actually turn out to be a seminal programme that gives birth to a new generic style. I do recommend go and see it if you see if you can. I and mean, there are links on the Hopanmo Voice blog article about this, which um, may still be live. They're temporary links. I'm going to replace them with permanent links if if permanent links appear. But basically, Brown he's a, he attempts to convince a man that the world has ended in a scenario which is very very common to many dystopian horror films. This is where a giant meteorite hits the Earth and does widespread damage, and then. Most of the survivors are struck down by a virus that turns them into zombies and human civilization collapses. Um, now, to select his, um, what do I call him, contestant, 
uh, Brown held an audition of volunteers, and the winner was chosen secretly, and all the hopefuls were told that they failed. Then Darren Brown then enlisted the help of the family and friends of this chosen one, who was a man called Stephen Brosman, Brosnan from Buckinghamshire. And over a two-month period, all the people in Brosnan's life agreed to collaborate in a conspiracy to lay the background for what was to come. They fed him fake news stories, and they also hacked into his TV set, his mobile phone. They planted actors who struck up conversations about an approaching meteor shower. And they even had celebrity experts, you know, make false tweets. It was quite, really quite remarkable. Now, uh, the reason Brown selected Brosnan for this program was because he felt that he, Brosnan was the right psychological type. He was amenable to persuasion and things like that. And he also said that he was living a thoughtless existence. He was not caring for the people around him. Um, what was he? Unambitious, dispassionate, slothful, immature, like a kind of overgrown teenager who didn't clean up his room and made his mother do his washing and cooking for him. Uh, he had trouble keeping a job, spent all his free time down the pub. Now, Darren Brown hoped that by losing everything he took for granted, Brosnan would discover a new lease of life. He'd develop courage and compassion and decisiveness. Um, you know, Darren Brown really said, I want to change this man for the better. So what happened was the mental seeds were, pl the mental seeds were planted and over a two-month period, and then, then it was ready to trigger Armageddon. So Brosnan, he takes this chartered coach with his friend, who's an accomplice, like all, all the other people are, in this conspiracy, to a rock concert. And then explosions get set off and the people on board start screaming in fear, even though they're all actors and they've got earpieces and they're taking instructions from the director's gallery. And Darren Brown, he's like a sort of incognito fellow passenger. He puts Brosnan into a, into a hypnotic trance and leads him to a studio that's made to look like an abandoned military hospital. And there, Brosnan is just left to wake up alone and he emerges into what he thinks is a devastated world. The country's under martial law, the infrastructure is shattered, and these flesh-eating, cannibalistic zombies roam the, roam the street. Um, he meets a young girl there, who of course is an actress, and Brown hopes that this will appeal to his kind of submerged, protective and compassionate nature. And then they fall in with other survivors, and a plot develops, which is supposed to test Brosnan's leadership qualities and his conscience and his sense of responsibility. Now, many people are saying Darren Brown has really gone too far this time. Um, there's also there's rumours that the entire event was staged. It was simply drama, and Brosnan was just another actor. Now, Darren Brown has countered this. He claims to be able to prove that Brosnan is a real person. And he says, I had a doctor and a psychologist monitoring him. We were going to step in the moment we thought his emotional and physical health was in danger, and we were going to abort the stunt. I don't care. I find this kind of television unpleasant, like I do all reality TV. And I think it's getting to the point where our imaginations are just dumbed down so much that make-believe just doesn't do. Now, breaching the boundaries of what is considered tasteful, a few years you just couldn't do it, but now we just love it. We watch these housemate evictions and these walks of shame and these bush, bush tucker challenges. And um, I don't know, make, making a bloke think that he's in a haunted college is one thing, right? Making him think that his entire world is destroyed is something totally different. And I think Darren Brown's justification stinks. Because uh, he's very, very arrogant, and psychologists tend to be, as I was explaining last week with Neil Sanders. You know, that I hate, I hate the whole very word psychologists. Uh, he, he says he's putting Brosnan through this horrifying ordeal for his own good. Well, how the hell does he know that Brosnan is going to emerge, emerge some kind of heroic intellectual giant? What if the opposite occurs? What if he's traumatised? What if he's incapacitated? What if he suffers a nervous breakdown? Is this really safe? And although it is true that facing if you face advert ad adversity... It can be very character building in the long term and in retrospect. But, you know, the kind of adversity that could come out of believing the entire world as you know it has been annihilated and that there's no one left but zombies, that could destroy your character. It could actually demolish you, not build, it up, build you up. And what could that could result in? Despair, destitution, depression. What if he kills himself on air? I'll tell you what, right? If I was, if I was that guy, Steve Brosnan, and someone played a trick on me like, like that on me, I'd go straight to the police and I'd report them for assault and kidnapping. And it's very, very judgmental as well to pour scorn on a man just because he enjoys vegging out in front of the TV with a tube. 
and stuff like that. Why, why does that mean that he's living a worthless life? Just because he ticks a few boxes on a bloody MMPI form? I mean, how dare Darren Brown be so presumptuous and condescending? And this is, this is once again, this is typical shrink megalomania. You know, it really is. It's just, it's just typical. I mean, it, 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 I still find it hard to believe that it's real and that maybe it is all fake. Because, I mean, if you think about it, his mother, his father, all his friends were all helping him convince, to convince this man that their son was living in a ruined world as a lone survivor. Did none of them get a conscience for that? And there's another aspect of this program that disturbs me, and that's something that disturbs me about many reality TV shows, and that is they make it look glamorous to be under CCTV. And not only that, it's the emotional abuse, it's the psychological abuse. And in, in the case of Apocalypse, we're talking about gaslighting. This is, this is a form of psychological abuse in which the people you live with create an organised false scenario to undermine your self-confidence. <clears throat> and they can condition you into thinking and feeling and behaving in a certain way. And I've noticed in the last few years, you, you get these themes of global cataclysm a lot more than you used to. I mean, there's dystopian sort of post-apocalyptic films and books are coming out. They're coming out of the press by the score. You know, old films of this genre have been remade. You know, zombie films and stuff like that all being remade. There's something in the air that's preparing us for the end of the world. I don't know what that is. I mean, I don't believe the world will end. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a sort of apocalypse. I'm not a sort of like Armageddon aficionado. But it seems that people in the media are trying to persuade us that. Maybe, maybe because they're going to stage something that will give them a blank slate for the New World Order. Now, if that's the case, the whole of the media is acting like a giant version of Darren Brown and one of his simulations. However, this simulation will not work if we rumble it, and we've got to work it out that it's a charade, and then the trick doesn't work. Right. Um, last Sunday was Military Religion Day. Do you remember? I know I've written about this, I've spoken about it before, but every year I come back to it because I think it's really important. It's the time of year when we're all expected to fall on the ground in a frenzy of religious worship, not of God, but of other people. And why? Because they do a particular job. I mean, normally it's two days, because you have November the 11th, and which is the uh, Remembrance Day, and then there's Remembrance Sunday, the following, the following Sunday. But... 11th fell on a Sunday, so there's only one this year, so that's, that's different. Um, so does the military religion exist? Is there any justification for it? And why is it promoted so vigorously in our culture and in our society and media? Well, there's no doubt that it exists. I mean, anybody who's in the armed forces or has been in the armed forces is forever marked out as a superior class. You're almost like a separate species. I mean, I was, I was myself in the Royal Navy for a very, very short time, but... Um, that's a long. That's a story for another time. It's to, to do with mind control and stuff like that. But um, I came out quite early. You know, but I I do remember um, during the fireman strike a few years ago, the army filled in, and there was a debate in the media about the army's the Green Goddess fire engines, these very old fire engines that has a design from the 1930s, and they were saying, well, maybe the armed forces should be allowed to use modern firefighting equipment. And I said, well, look, they're not trained for that, are they? They have they have to use their own equipment. Because um, the fire brigade, these firemen, they have to train for months to become proficient in using this equipment. You know, who's going to give the army that training? And someone turned around and says, but Ben, these are soldiers. These are soldiers, he thought. They're superhuman man-gods. They know everything and can do everything. It's only we mere mortals who need training. It's, you see what I mean by them, a separate species? And there's, a, there's this ridiculous word, civilian. And I know I use that word too, but I only do it facetiously and ironically. And it implies there's some kind of fundamental difference between somebody in the military and somebody who's not. Well, I don't see it personally. And for people who are in the army that I know, the effect it has on them is remarkable. I mean, I'm talking to somebody and I meet somebody who's in the, in the forces. They'll find some way to slip it into the conversation within two or three sentences. And then they always expect me to, to immediately change the subject and talk about it. It's, they can become quite peeved, actually, when I don't. Um, you know, it seems they need that recognition of their status. You know, and they want that. And um, I was actually once challenged by a, a group of uniformed soldiers in a London pub, you know, because I wasn't looking at them. And the way they acted towards me, you'd think I just dumped rubbish in their garden. 
And if a soldier is in the news for a non-military reason, their, their status as a soldier will always be alluded to, even if it's, it is irrelevant to the story. And for example, no article or interview about the singer James Blunt has so far failed to address the fact that he used to be an army officer. But why is it the very little journalist, journalistic literature about another singer in the music press, Mark Almond, refers to his former life as a hospital porter? I think I'm the only one that's actually mentioned that. Now, in the same vein, we had a man recently rescued. He, he rescued a group of, pres of uh, pensioners from a burning building. And every news report kept saying this army sergeant was just driving past, off duty, and he went in and rescued these old folk from this house. But how often do you ever see the headline, insurance broker chases off mugger, or painter and decorator save child from flood? And, you know, we... we it's not just Remembrance Day. We have the Armed Forces Day now as well, which is amazing. It's, it is a religion that's being imposed on us. Now, is there any justification for it? Let's have a look. Well, if you look at it logically, if you join the army, you know, you're going to do something that inevitably carries some risk. And we see this today because, sadly, you know, hardly a day goes by when there's a, it's in the news that some young man or woman has been killed or injured in Afghanistan. And, sure, it is correct to feel respect towards anybody who does a difficult and dangerous job, like these soldiers. But fighting in Afghanistan is not the only dangerous job in the world. There are many other jobs in which those doing it have to face equal danger, or even more than a soldier in Afghanistan. A uh, mining, an oil rig worker, a fireman, deep sea diver. And according to the American and Canadian Almanac of 2008, the most dangerous job you can do is to be a fisherman. So why is there not a Fisherman's Memorial Day? Why are there no trawler disaster monuments in the centre of London. Why do we never open up a copy of The Sun and see the word hero jumping out at us concerning a young man who got killed or maimed so that we could enjoy eating something with our chips? Why is his body not paraded through Wooden Bassett with people on the street doffing their hats in respect? Now, it's true that there are non-military memorials. In fact, I've been on a search for them and I found a few, but you'll find they're tucked away in small local areas, and they're also invariably far less, far less ostentatious in nature. And they're often, they're only erected usually on a very low budget, sometimes after a long campaign by the people they represent. And conversely, you, know, you can't walk through any city centre without seeing military memorials. And in London, it's like a mausoleum. You go around sort of Westminster and Victoria area, Buckingham Palace, Whitehall, there's these enormous structures standing in pride of place. They're like sacred temples. A separate one for each war, a separate one for each branch of the services. And it's, I know it's very, very difficult to study this subject and to ask these questions because, you know, you have to strip away so much cultural baggage. And inevitably, you encounter people who react angrily. These, you even ask these questions. Even people in the truth movement don't, aren't willing to step back and look at this. So why has the military religion been created and why is it maintained? And I, I think this is best summed up by Dr. Lawrence Britt in his 14 Signs of Fascism. Soldiers and military service are glamorised and glorified. The military and war are so important to the Illuminati-occupied governments and that's why they do it. But it keeps people signing up. I mean, you want to be a social god? Do you want everyone to respect you? Do you want all the girls to fancy you? Who could turn down an opportunity like that? Would they do it otherwise? I mean... And, you know, the way um, people who refuse to fight are treated, I mean, it's not so bad now, right, but it's, it's improved in the last century because of the horrors of World War I. But you still get accusations, you know, cowards, chicken, conchies, peaceniks, you know, as if it takes a real man to blow somebody up so that an oil company can build a pipeline through their village. The military religion has always had a place in Illuminati-controlled society throughout history, but in the last few years it's got a lot worse. Since 9-11, you know, I think that was when it started, and it's been spread more thickly. And, you know, the, I do think it's right to show respect and hold memorials for people killed in wars and for those who fight them. And I, I, I certainly don't think we should get rid of Remembrance Day. But for me, Remembrance, you know, when people are killed in wars, it's a tragedy. It's not something to sanctify, revel in. On the cenotaph, you go to the cenotaph in London, you'll see that on the side are the words, The Glorious Dead. Look it up, you'll see, you'll look pictures of it. The Glorious Dead. Well, look, 
But when I was at my hospital, I actually saw the victims of the Afghanistan war. And I'll tell you, there is nothing glorious about dying in war. And I, I do think there's a ritual element to a lot of what goes on in war. <clears throat> I think um, a lot of the major wars were actually mass sacrifices. I used to wear the old poppy until about 2005. And then something happened, right? In July of 2005, just a few days after the carnage of 7-7, there was the D-Day 60 celebration, which was basically commemorating the 60th anniversary of D-Day. And um, it took place while Londoners were still in shock from this, from this terrorist atrocity. And the highlight of the ceremony was a flypass by an original Lancaster bomber, which was a weapons platform designed to kill millions of innocent people in the cities of Germany. And it flew over the mall outside Buckingham Palace, and it dropped one million poppy petals onto the crowd below, including the royal family who were on the balcony of the palace. These petals were supposed to symbolise the million uh, British and Commonwealth troops who died in World War II, 300,000 in Britain and um, the rest from the Commonwealth. Now, as these petals rained down, it hit me that I was watching a blood sacrifice. This is what they do in these Illuminati temples. They let the blood drip down. It's an awful subject. I'm not going to discuss it in detail. But there's, it's symbolism, right? And the, the TV camera honed in on the Queen, and I was disgusted to see her dancing and laughing as these poppies fell around her like snow. I mean, you may not think so, but the, the aristocracy, they are into black magic big time. They really very are. They really are. So, um, so um, that's uh, the news for today. I hope you enjoyed that. Papanwo Radio News. And now we've got another great song coming up. It's one called Down Under. And it's got a very funny video if you want to, to look it up. Um, I hope you enjoy it anyway. So um, uh, stay where you're sitting and don't touch your dials because space weather is up next. <laughs> Panwo Radio, Space Weather. Right, uh, the phase of the moon. It's new. And, um, of course, because it's a new moon, all sorts of things can happen. And then you'll soon find out what that is in a minute. Um, it, over England, it's rising at 6.44 a.m., setting at 3.53 p.m. Sorry, that's 4.53 p.m. So it's not that bad. Um, and, um, of course, if you live further north, or it'll be um, earlier than that, and it'll, if you live... Further south, it'll be later. Right, sunrise. Um, yeah, that's the moon. Sorry, that's the moon rising, 6:44, setting for 3:53. Yeah, sunrise 7:33 a.m., sunset 4:15 p.m. Now, um, during a new moon, the sun tends to follow the moon, and sometimes, sometimes the moon can follow the sun very, very closely indeed. And it is at the moment because, in a few hours' time, there's going to be a total eclipse of the sun. Now, um, eclipses are more common than you might think. They actually happen every 18 months. It's just they happen in different places every time, and usually um, usually only about once every 50 years to 100 years in a particular place. Um, this eclipse of the sun, I wonder if actually Steve Trueblue's watching it, because it's happening over Queensland, Australia. Um, it's going to happen at... Um, well, at the path is totality. It cuts right across from a place called Port, uh, Port Douglas to a place called Cairns. And um, there are people there right now on crew, cruise ships, there are divers, and there's lots and lots of people at the beach at the moment to, to witness the early morning sun disappear behind the moon for two minutes. Now, um, it's starting at um, 8.38pm, which is about coming up soon, and actually it's uh, sooner than I thought, it's less than an hour now, and the moon is going to come over the sun, and um, it's going to be quite amazing. We haven't had a... We did have one in 1999, we had an eclipse here, but it was only partial, and it was, only to it was to partial in most of the country, only total in the south of Cornwall. Um, we will be getting another one, I think, in about 80 years or something, so you have, may have to travel abroad if you want to see one. Sunspots. Right, we've got a large number of small but very lively sunspot clusters across both the tropics of the disk. Now, um, that's... The 19.47 thing is, is amazing because the sunspots right now are, nine, are around the 19.47 latitudes. 
Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm afraid I don't have time to explain it, but there's something very special about the latitude 19.47 degrees. And we'll explain more about that later, but basically that's where most sunspots appear. It's also on Earth where things like the Hawaiian volcano is, and on Mars you get Olympus Mons volcano, the great red spot on Jupiter. <clears throat> there's something special about that latitude for reasons I'll explain on another show. But we've... Um, We've had no spotless days, of course, but there's been a, um, a, a coronal mass ejection, and I'll explain that, right, because a lot's been happening. Yeah, there's um, a coronal mass ejection has actually struck the Earth. Now, don't panic. It's not the end of the world because these things do happen from time to time, but it happened about 11 p.m. last night. So if you're watching TV last night or on the phone and you've got some um, interference, you'll know why. It's because of this CME. Um, but there was massive auroras over Scandinavia, and a man called Oscar Peterson has sent some lovely pictures in from Lulila, Sweden, which I'm looking at right now, but unfortunately you can't see them. Yeah. Um, basically, this, this coronal mass ejection is, um, it causes massive, uh, it, it does cause destability of the magnetic field of the Earth. It does cause geomagnetic storms, which could last for a while. So do, do be aware of that. You may get some problems on the internet or on your phone or something like that. Now, um, solar flares. Yep, overnight and into today, there have been multiple solar flares, one of which caused this CME. Um, they're in the low to mid, sort of, still in the, sort of in the low C range, but they've in the low M range. But one of them did reach up to the middle of the M range, so we're getting more activity than we did last week. There's been a has been a large increase. All right, there's a, been a few more middle C ones as well, um, a few like aftershocks, and activity remains high. There's an unstable baseline. So it could be, you know, I was talking last week about the solar maximum. Well, maybe that has actually finally arrived. But we won't know for a while because we'll have to survey the data over a long period of, of time. So let's find out. Anyway, all this activity has caused a uh, high geometric, geomagnetic storm risk. In the middle latitudes, the activity level is 35%. There's a 25% chance of a minor storm and a 5% chance of a severe storm. In the high latitudes, the activity is 30%, and there's also a minor chance of a 32, a 25% chance of a minor storm, 5% chance of severe. And, um, yeah, this, this, CMA, this uh, sort of CMI, CME has, has made it pretty stormy in the Earth's magnetosphere, and right now we're passing through the tail, through the trail, or the wake of this coronal mass ejection, so we could still get some problems. Near-Earth asteroids... On Friday and Saturday, 2012 VQ6 and 2012 VC26 passed 1.8 lunar distances and 2.3 lunar distances away. Um, but luckily the former is just 46 feet across and the latter is just 24. So they're very small, flying boulders. Now, um, these, these small objects, like I say, tend to be the ones discovered at short notice, so don't panic. Now, there are a few more 100-foot-plus ones that are going to be passing within 10 lunar distances in the next few days, or the last, next couple of weeks, but all the biggest ones on the forecast are a long way away, double figures distance. Um, now, on the, December the 12th, the massive Tutatis asteroid, which is 1.6 miles in diameter, is going to pass 18 lunar distances away at its closest point of approach. And it may be visible to the naked eye as a small speck, so keep an eye out for that. Now, that is going to be on December the 12th. So a while yet. The forecast is now extended to February the 5th. The solar wind speed is 282 miles per second. The density has gone up a bit to uh, 0.2563 particles per cubic inch. Panwo Radio Space Weather. Right, now it's time for our guest interview. And this week we have Steve Trueblue, who is a gnosis teacher, a filmmaker, and a researcher from Australia. And as I explained earlier, he's a committed analyst of this untouchable, untouchable thing called the skeptic movement. And if you go to YouTube, look up Kimbo99, K-I-M-B-O-99. You'll find him very, very interesting indeed.
Hi, this is George from the Prisoner Broadcast. You're listening to the Havano Radio Show with Ben, Emma and Jones on Critical Mass Radio. Good evening, St- Steve Trueblue. Welcome to Hapanwo Radio. How are you this evening? I'm doing very well, thank you. It's nice to hear your voice in such excellent quality in Sydney, Australia. Oh, good. It's, it's, I never, I never stop marvelling at this technology. You know, it's crazy. Yeah, actually, it's, it's astonishing. Yeah, it's actually morning where I'm speaking now, and evening when you are. But when the radio show goes out on Tuesday, it will be um, evening for both of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so to yeah, speak, you know. yeah. So, well, tell us a little bit about yourself and well, how you got involved. Well, I kept- yeah, yeah. I came on the net to be a Gnosis teacher to enable people to quickly, accurately, and with physical evidence, uh, get the divine spark to come out to play in their internal awareness. Mm. This is called Gnosis. It's little known, uh, and it's a, it's a third, al- it's an alternative to religion, and it's got physical evidence to back it up. Mm. The problem I encountered when I came on the net that I was besieged by grasshopper plagues of skeptics that's people preaching evolution with religious fervor mm. and ended up learning all about them instead oh, so, yeah i think everyone everyone who has any presence any significant presence on the net you sooner or later the skeptics will come for you and it's a it's, i found this myself mm. yeah i mean this is i'm not yep. this is not to sort of like discredit uh any individual skeptic i mean i've got skeptics who are friends you know of mine you yep. know but um they as a group they rather like um they can they can resemble a school of piranhas attacking a corpse. <laughs> I found, That's about yeah. all they really are. Yeah. So, so the skeptics. Firstly, I mean, um, I've, I've, if, if listeners go to program five of uh, Panwo Radio, you'll find I do a skeptic special where I go into this in more detail. But just just to summarise, I mean, when we, you know, when it comes to what a skeptic is, now a skeptic yeah. a skeptic describe themselves as. And purveyors of science and reason who apportion evidence and think logically, empirically. You know, they use they use words like that. Um, now, but that is actually not the description. It is a slogan, and I explain in more detail in program five. But um, to, to distinguish the two, I distinguish people like that as skeptics with a K, as opposed to skeptics with a C, who are people who yes. are really rational and really scientific. Um, mm. Now you use different terminology. You use the term pseudo skeptic, don't you? It's not much different. It's not much different. No. Uh, the truth is that we are all skeptics because we live in uh, an environment awash with mis and disinformation. Mm. Uh, specifically, advertising that's forever trying to prize money out of your pocket. So you've got to be a skeptic just watching television, mm. picking up a brochure or a newspaper, walking down the street. There's all this information trying to get eyes, uh, trying to get money out of your pocket. Uh, so we we all have to be skeptical to survive in a modern capitalist society. Yes. And for a bunch of young men to run around saying, sticking their chest out saying we are skeptics, uh, they're seriously out of tune with the rest of society. For yeah. one thing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And then, um, the thing is about skeptics is, I mean, yeah. there are people. A perfect example of what I'm saying is how somebody who does use science and reason and empirical logic to come to a conclusion that for instance the paranormal is real people like Rupert Sheldrake for instance or Dr. Peter Fennick and other individuals like that that person uh-huh. is immediately labelled a believer whereas 
conversely, you get somebody who knows absolutely nothing about science and never uses the scientific method, and they say, well, there ain't no such things as ghosts or UFOs or the paranormal. It's all in your head, isn't it? That person yes. is immediately yes. called a sceptic. So it's, yes. impossible to re it's impossible to escape the conclusion that uh, a sceptic... A sceptic with a K is simply somebody who has certain opinions about certain subjects. In other words, they think the paranormal doesn't exist, they think that the conspiracy theories aren't real, that etc., etc., etc. So that's what I think distinguishes so-called sceptics from so-called believers. Can I, can, I, can I refine what you've said? Just Certainly. A bit. Um, they pose as scientists using scientific jargon. Mm. And they like to play prosecutor like, you know, I don't believe you, that's an anecdotal report. You should be more scientific. What's wrong with you? They talk mm. down to you in a kind of tone, you see. And mm. it slowly dawns on you that they're battering you with every phrase and every sentence they utter. And they really know nothing about the subject at heart that you're talking about, the, the data, the evidence, or whatever it is, the theory. They have little or no understanding of it. Their only interest is head-kicking you. Mm. That's what they're really doing. They're actually hooligans, masquerading as, as so, crudely masquerading as scientists, which they because they normally come apart after two or three entries on YouTube, for example. Yeah. They portray their lack of interest, lack of knowledge, and and total non-caringness about the subject that you'd like to discuss, which could be your video, perhaps. Yeah. And they just sit there pouring. Uh, there's two kinds of um, aggression they come out with. There is head-kicking belligerents like Louis Sava. You ever heard of him? I've not heard of him, no. Oh, he's an Englishman you will love. He's the quintessential sceptic who just calls you a, a bloody idiot for believing no. in God, Christianity, or in fact, believing anything. And his rationale is for why you're an idiot is that everything is pointless. There are no connections between anything. He wrote a blog called Everything is Pointless. Do look it up. <laughs> it's a real sort of uh, peek into the... And guess what? He was a PhD student under Jedi Master Peter French. Chris French. Do you mean Chris, Chris French? Yeah, Chris French. Yeah, oh, the, God. Oh, yeah. well, <laughs> he's had the perfect so education. Really he's worth a look up. Now, that's ra raving belligerence at the camera. The other kind of uh, belligerence you meet from sceptics is... Um, Slow venom. Mm. Like they'll say things like, uh, you, you might go to a global warming video and you'll say, I don't believe in global warming. And the skeptic will say, But then you don't really know the scientific method, do you? Mm. And you'll go, That's funny because everyone's been to high school. Why would anyone type that? Mm. And <laughs> you'll see they continually try to erode you with these acid comments, these slow venom comments. It might take you a while to figure out what they're doing, but they're suffering from narcissism, which mm. causes them to detest everyone they meet and try and put them down without them hardly noticing with these little comments eroding away all their self-esteem. Now, that's the other, like, there's, there's a spectrum. There's belligerent aggression and there's this slow venom aggression from the most narcissistic uh, sceptics. We see this. You've got Louis Sauber at the other end, screaming and raging at the camera. He's, he's the classic pseudo-sceptic. Right, I have to look you've him got, up. Hmm. You've got to look him up. Hmm. S-A-double-V-A. And uh, he failed the PhD program for exactly the same reasons that Susan Blackmore did. He couldn't find any uh, paranormal because it doesn't exist. So why did he ever want a PhD? I don't know. Hmm. But, but I think his facial expressions indicate that he's mildly autistic. Um. Uh, he makes some strange faces at the camera while he's yelling and shouting that uh, average people just don't do. And um, he's not able to connect thoughts and sentences together in a logical sequence. So how he could ever get a job as a PhD um, student, I can't imagine. It really says something about sceptics. He's the best they could produce. Yeah. Well, he's uh, been taught by <clears throat> the man who taught him is, 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 a, is the kind of pop sceptic, I think, in this country at the moment. I'm Professor Chris yeah. French, who I talk about yeah. earlier in the program, and I, I take the Mickey album a bit. <laughs> even he yeah. thought that was funny. You know, I've, I've met him a couple of times. Even he laughed. Even he laughed at the, my joke against the power him. But um, I mean, yeah. it, it, all, it all comes down to what I'm trying to work out exactly what makes them tick, exactly what's, you know, what the psychology of these people. I mean, what exactly what? do they want? What, what motivates well, I'll them? You, I'll tell you what they're doing. I've just mm. made a page. I, I, I just put it up a few hours ago. 
mm-hmm. about where Psychop comes from in 1976. It's a result of a, a fabulously rich Stalinist heir, a, a fabulously rich man who preaches communism. Can you believe that? Um, I all can all well believe it. I mean, <laughs> I can, a lot of, a lot of Marxists are... Prominent Marxists are very often extremely capitalistic. <laughs> yeah. Well, this guy called Corliss Lamont, I made a page on it, and I'll flick it to you after we do Thanks. this. But he, um, he is so rich because he was... Um, he inherited money from the J.P. Morgan business empire. Whoa, 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 <laughs> yeah. Exactly, right? Yeah. So he goes to Russia in 1932, and he comes back religiously transformed. He's had an epiphany. He's fallen in love with a religious icon called Joseph Stalin. Oh, my God. And he's written book after book after book about Stalinism is the only way. It will over, it will fill the earth, cover the earth. It has to do because it is the only way to live, you see. Mm. And he's an apologist for all the, the butchery, the massacre, the disappearances, and the Gulag Archipelago. Yeah. He said they all deserved it. Oh, my God. <laughs> Papa Stalin has never done a thing wrong. I know. I'm Corliss Lamont right now. He had so much money, he purchased an entire organization, bought all the staff in it, Paul Kurtz. Now, that's a name editor. I've heard. Paul Kurtz is the editor of, editor of the Humanist magazine that promotes humanism. Mm. It was hijacked to become Stalinism, but they retitled it Humanism as a kind of cover, you see. Then they set up Psychop. That's Psychop the, was the, the committee, sorry. Yeah, the committee, yeah, to suppress the uh, the paranormal and religious claims, it's basically. Got this, uh, it's got this very Orwellian name, the Committee for the Scientific Investigation for Claims of the Paranormal. <laughs> and what a lovely, sweet name that is, Steve. You know, you can't, you can't imagine a butter wouldn't melt in their mouth, would they? Scientific investigation. <laughs> Everybody is in favour of that. And claims yes, of the paranormal. They're the claims. They oh. might be real, you know. Yes. Mm. So this Paul it, Kurtz it, was it, the editor. Yes. Now, he was also the purveyor of pornographic books. Was he? My God. He has a, there's a connection to pedophilia. Mm. It's everywhere, right? You know that from the well, newspaper. Yes. Right, okay. So mm. it's the web, right? You can't separate these things. Nothing happens in isolation. That's right. Uh, do remember that. Now, Psychop also debunks UFOs. Yes. So they've got connections to the U.S. government and the establishment. Mm. So it's not solely a Stalinist organisation uh, coming out of the 1930s. It's got it's taken on more modern functions, yeah. you see, to suit other parts of the the new world order, for want of yeah. a better phrase. Now, what happened was, I'll tell you what happened. Stalinism depends on a kind of rebound reaction from people. You run into a group of unhappy, dis, uh, disgruntled people and you say, look, a lot of your problems are caused by terrible religions like the Catholic Church. We will give you, we'll teach you something wonderful called Stalinism, Marxism, uh, Marxism, uh, Trotskyism, mm. and you will then be transformed into the, into a workers' paradise. And yeah. and people go, well, that sounds like a good idea. I hate religion. That's pretty good. What have you got instead? And they have all this Marxist waffle, which is pseudo-religious waffle full of mm. phrases it's all very appealing to intellectuals it takes years to unravel the lies yeah now there's a problem with that it depends on absolute rebuttal of religion and absolutely no scientific evidence of god the paranormal or telepathy as soon as you have any one of those stalinism loses all its appeal because like, you can't say there's no scientific evidence of god yeah because i mean with- I mean, Karl, it's one of the fundamental principles of Marxism. I think Karl Marx is often quoted as saying that religion is the opium of the people. Yes. You know, what he actually meant was spirituality, but, um, you know, but so yes, we'll, yes. we'll come into that, yeah. And Karl Marx was simply a sleepwalker like so many other people, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. They haven't worked up yet. But um, now, uh, where was I then? So when a man called J.B. Ryan came along in the 1950s and he announced he'd just finished 30-odd years of research since 1927, which irrefutably proved, uh, by the most rigorous scientific method, irrefutably proved telepathy, mm. that sent a bolt of horror through Corliss Lamont, who'd purchased this wonderful humanist organisation to flog Stalinism mm. so it would take over the world. And it went like a lightning bolt for him because he realised that Stalinism was no longer a political option uh, against capitalism or socialism or anything else because mm. 
if you've got telepathy, that means likely communication with dead people too, and possibly yeah. a confirmation of afterlife. And horror, horror, horror. Beyond all that is, well, there must be a God. It's logical. Yeah. Well, if if, if the logic is if if consciousness and communic and, and sense, you know, sensory perception is not with it is not coming through the physical senses and physical brain, then when mm. the physical senses and brain stop working at our death, there's no reason to think that our mind should be destroyed at that moment. Exactly. Mm. So that's good by Stalinism. Mm. It, it's not a political alternative anymore. Once. Uh, the paranormal, once telepathy, once remote viewing is established, you see. Yeah. So, Corliss Lamont put his humanist magazine writers, humanist association magazine writers, to work assassinating the character of J.B. Ryan, who was a very respected and one of the most leading parapsychologists in the world. And they actually called him insane. Oh. They actually wrote that down and published it and claimed to be a serious academic organisation. And this was in the 1950s? Yes. Oh, anyway, things, haven't, it, things haven't changed much, have they, Steve? I mean, because to this day, sim people similar to Ryan will be called names in a similar way. They'll be called crazy, they'll be called frauds. Well, Sheldrake is. Yeah, it happens to yeah. Sheldrake all the time. Yeah, yeah. So not, things haven't changed all that much. Yeah. So what he realised was he wasn't doing enough. And uh, there was a whole lot of, uh, what can I say, contempt for the so-called superstitions of general society like astrology. And... Yeah. Um, that's code for religion, by the way, when they say superstitions. Yeah. They don't want to write thing off as a superstition so you become a good Stalinist, right? A good communist yeah. mm. and ascend to the workers' paradise. Um, yeah. So they set up this thing in 1976, this psychop thing, and they invited all these public well-known names like Carl Sagan, Richard Dawkins, James Randi, Flamboyant, people like that. People who already had uh, known public images and they said, we are going to be a propaganda group and demolish religions, you see. Now, yeah. it occupies 20% of your brain tissue. How realistic was that? I mean, Richard Dawkins did know, and he's admitted it, yeah. that you just can't eradicate... If you want to eradicate 20% of your brain that does religious functions, you'll need a scalpel. But would <laughs> you really want to do that to 7 billion people? And that's, that's what this... Rich well, call Steve, it. we mustn't give them ideas. <laughs> <laughs> That's next time. World, what I've heard that. <laughs> I think, yeah, what they're going to talk about the next Bilderberg meeting, eh? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. We have a new machine. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, well. Yes. Do it yourself, brain surgery, mm. yes. Yeah, uh, but uh, when you think about it, a rich man coming out of the 1930s thinking that you can talk, you can fence off people's brains by talking and, and you know, mm. and uh, propaganda is preposterous. Yeah. It really but they got the money to do it, so they've really wasted probably millions of dollars. But it uh, it's carrying on today. He's dead. He died in the late nineties, mm. uh, leaving his footprint all over Google. Mister Corliss Lamont. All right, I'll look him up too. Blatant communist, blatant communist and uh, he was called the most. I think the most persistent Soviet publicist in America. He was mm. investigated very closely by the. House of Un-American Activities in the 1950s. Yeah. He was a communist, mm. a raving communist, mm. trying to Sovietize America, you see, mm. and getting rid of religions and uh, getting everyone ready to, to be transformed into a, a workers' paradise uh, peasant. That was his whole idea, <coughs> which is like worse than a pipe dream, more impractical, more silly, more, more infantile than um, you could imagine, really. Yeah. Now, um, this, this organization he founded, PSYCOP, which is supposedly um, an accidental acronym, but um, I wonder if, you know, the, the police it, it sort of can be translated as the, or transliterated as the, the policeman of PSY, of, um, PSI, you know. But yeah. um, it contains some, I mean, the members of PSYCOP, the, the, the fellows, as they call them, um, although PSYCOP mm. is not an official academic kind of institution. They call them fellows. Um, but they are people like Carl Sagan. You know, these are household names, Carl Sagan... Um, yeah. And of course, those these sort of pop skeptics like James Randi and Michael Shermer, and today yeah. these guys are always called on. To, in, whenever the media is studying the paranormal, these guys come on to um, to give the other side of the story. Now, I wouldn't have a problem with that, to be honest, if only the media that was inviting them on was in any way fair or impartial. But they're not. Yeah, they meet. They tend to sort of like ridicule the the, the person promoting the things. People like Rupert Sheldrake or, or you and me who promote these yeah. things. And yeah. they sort of like present the 
the skeptical guys are kind of um, sort of they usually photograph him in, in his suit, you know, with a yeah. sort of heroic pose, you know, and they they quote yeah. him very very sort of rationally. Whereas people like you and me would be sort of like we'll be filmed in our bedroom, sort of hunched over our computer in our scruffy pajamas and things like that, you know. So yeah. it's very very biased, very very propaganda. Well, it's been noticed that UK television shows are particularly like that, and yeah. they always give the skeptics in the suits the last word. We've noticed that. I, I urge all listeners, if you haven't heard it already, I urge all listeners to go to program. I think it's program seventeen in which I interview Frankie Ma um, about yeah. her own experiences involved in one of these TV productions recently. And um, also, if you can get go to the Sun newspaper, a certain Dr. David Clark has just written a an article called entitled Closed Encounters of the Third Kind, saying basically it's all over for UFOs. And again, complete nonsense, completely, yeah. completely biased. So yeah. now, Steve, um, now one of the guys you talk about an awful lot, because you have a YouTube channel, don't you? We'll talk more yeah. about your websites and things later. But on your YouTube channel, Kimbo99, yeah. you talk about James Randi and people like that. Now, A lot, a lot. Yes. What can you tell us about James Randi? Um, I saw him quoted the other day, and... What can I say? I was deeply disappointed, yet I, I was not surprised at all. At 80 years old, he was quoted as still talking about Santa Claus. Mm. Now, Santa Claus is something that only sceptics talk about. It's not the normal head content of an adult person. Yeah. Yet the whole sceptic movement talks about Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny um, as a put-down toward other people. You see, it's the worst insult. And, and Dawkins says Tooth Fairy, yes. doesn't he? But it's always, it's, yes. it's, yeah, it's, it is. It's always it's stylish. They always compare, open yeah. Yeah. They compare what we yeah. do to belief in Santa Claus, which you have when you're a kid, or the Tooth Fairy. Yes. And there's a clue. You can go to a website on YouTube called Shock of God, and there's a hundred uh, sceptics confessing that the real reason they hate religion is that they were traumatised by the Santa Claus myth, the story turning out to be a myth. Now, that causes physical brain damage to some people who are very susceptible, highly strung individuals in their childhood. And mm. I, I've actually met, and I've got made videos of it, of grown men, 50, 60, 70 years old, still grumbling about Santa Claus. Maybe this is why James Randi actually looks like Santa Claus, has made himself look that way. What big hat? One. Yep, he's got this big beard, which maybe he's grown that to on purpose. All he needs is the red jacket, doesn't he? And he can go ho, ho, yeah. ho. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I got a, a comment from a fellow called Dazza Star on YouTube. He's a bright young fellow. Oh, and, uh, to him. Yeah, he chases uh, skeptics all over the place, confronts them. Mm. And um, he said he's actually chased Randy personally and figured out his online uh, monikers and found that Randy uses what seems to be just two monikers. Mm. And uh, he's, as far as we can tell, other sceptics model themselves on, on him, and they use all the same put-downs, uh, sneering narcissism. You yeah. are not worthy of even talking to me and all that sort of stuff. You don't understand the, the scientific method. And the usual thing they always say, um, well, you know, you've got no evidence of what you just said. Whatever you said has no standing. You've got no evidence. Yeah. Now, they never bring evidence of their own, but they always demand it from you. Yeah. And when you give, when, one thing I've often found is when you provide that evidence, even if you, if you meet the challenge and provide that evidence, they just immediately demand more. It's called raise, just, raising the bar. It's one of the yeah. tricks they use, raising the yeah. bar. Yeah. So you've got to ask the question, why do they do this? And the answer is really very simple. They want to imply that everything you do is a lie. They're calling you a liar to break down your self-esteem. Nothing is good enough. You can't produce anything good enough for them. Yeah. I mean, so it's puggable. I mean, a good example I used in Program 5, which I think I should repeat for clarity, is that uh, most, most skeptics, or in fact all skeptics with a K, will say that the Rendlesham Forest incident was not really an ex extraterrestrial UFO. But let's just, let's just imagine for a moment that an old man walking his dog had seen that in the seen that object in the forest. The first yeah. thing the sceptics of the K would say was, well, how come no one from the base saw it? You'd think they'd send the guards out to investigate. You'd think they'd even call um, the, the, base, the deputy base commander away from his Christmas party. Why didn't he go into the wood? Why didn't he take his tape recorder with him? If only he'd done that, I would believe you. But it didn't happen, so I'm afraid there's just not enough evidence. So I, I, yeah. I, I, I did a little impression of Chris French there at the end of that speech. Now, um, James Randi offers a million 
dollar challenge. Now I've I know I've, oh. I've been studying because I mean people say right people can't accuse me of not hearing both sides of the story because I attend yeah. skeptic events regularly. I'm I'm a member of Ox Oxford Skeptics in the pub. I go to Oxford uh, to the London Skeptics in the pub. I've also been in 2010. I went to Tam London where James Randi appeared live and I met the guy. Uh, yeah. Now um, he is he got a standing ovation when he came on stage, you know, um, yeah. and um, he's he's a hero to these people. I felt a bit subconscious. Yeah. I felt a bit subconscious because I was sit. It was a room full of about three hundred people. I was sitting down applauding. I just gave him a brief round of applause for politeness, but I was the only one sitting yeah. down. Everyone was staring at me. But, but um, yeah. he has this million dollar challenge, doesn't he? Now, um, yes. Yeah. Now, what do you think about that? Uh, it's made to be unwinnable, so that it's. Permanent proof that they, they think it's permanent proof, or people will accept that there's no proof of the paranormal, paranormal doesn't exist. You basically put something out of reach and say, whatever's out of reach is proving that the phenomenon that it's supposed to detect doesn't exist because there's been no hits on this phenomenon register called the million dollar um, uh, reward. Yeah. The fact is, only two people a year are even listened to. Mm. It's I mean, a complete proof. Well, I mean, what what I think annoys me is James. Whenever you hear James Randi talk, and he mentions his million dollar challenge, I mean, he actually talks as if he's if he is the only paranormal investigator in the world, basically. Yes. And that everybody else. I mean, he met, occasionally refers to his peers in a very very demeaning manner, like he he calls them kind of naive and um, and things yeah. like that. And he calls you know uses phrases like gull gullible Gary to talk about Professor Gary yeah. Schwartz, who is a, a, a yeah. try. He was, he was very actually a very very um, intelligent and very very articulate and rigorous um, yeah. investigator of paranormal phenomena. But um, Now, one of the things that's interesting, one thing that Gandhi talks about, he talks about his own million-dollar challenge. He claims no one's won it. But what he doesn't tell you is that several people have actually challenged him. And I urge listeners to go to my um, interview with Ross Hemsworth, which took, which was a couple of weeks ago. I think it's program, um, program 18. Yes. Now, Ross Hemsworth actually challenged James Randi to come to, for six weeks to come to Britain and to do yeah. a it's just six weeks investigation with him, and if at the end of that course, if Randy could explain everything that Hemsworth discovered discovered in rational, non paranormal terms, Hemsworth would give Randy one hundred thousand pounds to pay into the charity of his choice, presumably the J Ray. Right. And he said, yeah. if, at the end of it, if you can't prove it, you give me a million pounds, and I'll pay into a charity of your choice. Right. You know? And um, this is this, sorry, this would be presumably you know the um, and. Um, well, Randy didn't even he didn't even answer. I mean, people have made excuses for him, like, "Well, six weeks is a long time to spend, you know, for an old man to come across to England." I said, "Come on, it's cold and wet." You could earn a hundred. Come on, right? Six weeks in which he could earn a hundred thousand pounds, which he would be able to do easily, would he not? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so um, this is often he doesn't talk about that much. The those sorts of things point up to the fact that he's really a politician selling uh, a mindset to the people, and he's got to keep the, un the prize unwinnable and unwon. Mm. It, it has the function of creating the impression the paranormal doesn't exist. It's yeah. really a wonderful kind of fraud that fools mostly the most gullible skeptics. Yeah. They believe it utterly. They're devoted to the concept. And can I just say, when we... When you talk to skeptics, you will notice there's a key word they often use, and you just used it yourself there, quoting one of them. Mm. I've been called gullible probably 500 or 1,000 times by skeptics, you see. Mm. And you've got to ask the question, why do they all say this in unison? And the answer is they hate themselves because when they were small, they hated themselves for being so gullible as to believe in Santa Claus for way too long. Mm. And they never, they never recover from the trauma of realising how gullible they were, hating themselves and deciding to never believe anything ever again for the rest of their life. So they become professional unbelievers, professional sceptics. Mm. Right, well, that's, that's something I didn't sort of, hadn't quite occurred to me. But, um, yeah. after, but you having, picked you, up on it. It's, yeah. it's in their diction. And you don't talk like that. Only they talk about it. Mm. It's, a, it's the worst insult sceptics can say to you. And it's it's... Code for that's what happened to me when I was seven. When I was eight, it happened to me. I was yeah. so gullible. I can't. I can't risk it ever again. I'll well, become a skeptic. Right. Well, I've never thought of that before. But now you've mentioned it. Now you've come to mention it. And that's actually an interesting idea. You know, that's um, that's and, um, so... of, yeah, and it goes. There's another piece to it. 
attached to it, which is bigger. Because when the crushing reality that they were gullible, they believed in Santa Claus, that happens on December the 25th. So what's the next logical conclusion for a damaged, angry, yet little mind, a literal mm. mind, to think? Christianity is yeah. a myth. Religion mm. is total garbage because I've been hurt real bad. Mm. I feel well, December the 25th is Christmas Day in the Christian... Yeah, yeah you can't separate it. Santa from Christianity, you see. No. So they sort of get king hit, and they go, I've been that gullible, I believed all this religion, I believed in Santa Claus, I must, I, Easter Bunny is another religious thing, it's all about Jesus and all that. So I can't risk ever believing anything ever again. Mm. And they hate themselves, um, whereas other people get over it. Ninety nine percent of people get over the Santa Claus myth, they just laugh about it. Mm. Or well, they yeah. figure it out themselves. It's a good detective exercise for growing minds. But a small number of people are highly susceptible to this deep feeling of betrayal, yeah. which results in self loathing. Oh, I, f I feel sorry for them, you know, for, for for that, you know. Of course I can't condone some of their behaviour, you know, but you can't you've got to have feel a bit of sympathy for them in that sense. I and mean, I was lucky, I think, because my parents never... My parents... I never heard about Santa Claus, actually, when I was a kid, luckily. Yeah. Yeah. You probably just got presents for Christmas and they didn't sort of make any stories up about it. That's it, yeah. I was from a Catholic family, but, I mean, a lot of... I mean, I was brought up... Even though my parents were Catholic, um, they were very liberal. And I was, you know, I was yeah. not... I didn't have it shoved down my throat like my, my mum did when she was a kid, you know. But, um, it might have been mentioned to you casually and you didn't take it too seriously too literally. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was not forced to, luckily, when I was a kid. I was yeah. brought up in a pretty religiously neutral environment, you know. Um, yeah. So was you, see, you see, before you're age 12, uh, there's a lot of research now in brain scans and all that. They know that children have uh, literal memories of literal minds. Whatever you say to them, they believe it to be fact until they're 12. Mm. Then maturation hormones start to become like into a teenager. And guess what? You become a metaphorical thinker, no longer a literal thinker. And yeah. you start rejecting things. Mm. Yeah, but, but it's much more efficient to think uh, metaphorically because you can connect uh, islands of metaphors. So you can yeah. learn things far more rapidly using metaphorical thinking. Now, guess what? These skeptics remain literal thinkers all of their lives. The maturation hormones don't work on their physical brain. So that's why you get these people reading the Bible literally and saying, this couldn't possibly happen when it's obviously meant to be a metaphor to any adult. But to a sceptic with a retarded brain still locked into literal thinking, um, you've got this problem with uh, they can't see it because they can't think metaphorically. So, yeah. so a sceptic and an ordinary person reads one page of the Bible, it to creates a totally different picture in their two heads. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting, the, the link between religion and, and you know official religion and scepticism, because I was listening to... Um, I can't remember his name, but he he does that thinking atheist blog. Um, he was on yeah. the he was on the Skeptico show with Alex Securis, and um, yes. he did he did the first. Alex normally does like two part um, interviews, he, and he refused to do this guy refused to do the second part. And Alex very accurately points out, you know, this this is a guy who went from one sort of religious mythical stru thinking structure to he just simply went over to another one. He, he went over to the one. atheist one. He went over from. Yeah. Um, re religion, religion to atheist religion. You know what I mean? One. Now, um, one thing, Steve, I've noticed um, in my study of the skeptic phenomenon, in my attempts to try and sort of like get inside their heads and find out how they think, is yep. um, I think a lot of them appear to be motivated by what I call MBA. And I know this stands for Master of Business Administration, but uh, for me, <coughs> I didn't know that when I came up with the term. MBA stands for Materialist Bravery Award. And earlier mm -hmm. in the show, you might have heard me actually um, do my little, um, cr my little sort of like homage to, to Professor Chris French, who actually is one of two, only two people in the world who hold the MBA gold, which is the highest, okay. it's the highest, it's the highest um, MBA accolade so I'll give anyone. Is there going to be gold and platinum or what? <laughs> I might, I mean, I'll tell you what, I might have to come up, I might have to come up with something higher actually if people go any further, but French has gone to the absolute limit. The other, the other MBA gold laureate is Susan Blackmore. And oh. uh, there are many, there are many, there are several hundred people who have actually awarded this um, this uh, this accolade too. There's there are about yeah. two hundred of them in all. Um, yeah. They say bronze, silver, and gold. You know, oh, and there's, also, you know, oh, there's yeah. also the deathbed MBA, which is, includes people like um, um, David Hume, the philosopher. You know, um, oh, yes. 
who said, I'm lying on my deathbed and I'll tell you there's no afterlife, but I can face up to it. I can, you know, and <laughs> basically what it, this is what it's about. It's basically saying that, okay, the, the, the fact, the, the, what they think there be no afterlife makes them superior because they can, in a sense, as French said in his little, in the little sketch I played earlier on, you know, we're hardwired yeah. to believe in this simply as a comfort blanket from facing our own mortality. And he said, and that, you know, what he doesn't say, of course, is that reading between the lines, anyone who can reject that comfort blanket is therefore some kind of um, intellectual superior person. More Spartan intellectually. Yeah, yeah they yeah. can say, well, I, I, I have the guts to face up to it and you don't. You know, yeah. I, think NBA, I think NBA does motivate a lot of these people. You know, it really, really does. What do you think about yeah. that? Well, I do like it. I've seen your little video on it. I like the way the way you presented it to the, uh, the Humanist Society there in London. Was it oh, London? Yeah, I gave the British Humanist Association a collective NBA bronze. That's right. I mean, I might have to upgrade yeah. them actually if they go much longer. I have to yeah. go down there. Well, I do like. Yeah, I do like that the NBA thing. Um, mm. In fact, I've often told skeptics uh, you're coming close to getting it if you keep talking like that because I get called a coward once or twice a week. Mm. And that's, from my point of view, it seems to be a playground taunt reflecting the very infantile nature of most grown men sceptics. Yeah. I mean, we were talking off air a minute ago about how, you know, humour seems to be something missing from sceptics in general. And Chris French is actually a, a rare exception because he actually does, he actually um, found that quite funny, that video. So he can take a joke yeah. himself, you know. Yeah. So, um, but humour is a rare quality, don't you think? In fact, I'd go as far as saying it's almost um, non-existent. Certainly in their outputs on the internet, mm. you never see jokes. Or you never see laughter. You never see... They never see the funny side of things. No, except I mean, they, they're some, they're, they're one, one thing they do, they are capable of, is sort of like rather scathing jokes about non-sceptics. I mean, Tim Minchin is a good example of this. Yeah, yeah. You know. Well, I'll tell you why I think they've got no humour. I think it's because they still have literal minds, and to understand humour and jokes, you need a metaphorical adult mind. Yeah. I, I think they're stuck in, you say something that's got double meaning, they only see the surface meaning. Mm. That's, that's it, yeah. Because, they see. because I remember uh, a school teacher once told me, she said, um, you wasting your time with sarcasm on children under 10, they don't get it. Mm. So I'm thinking... Is that the brain of a, of a grown sceptic, still less than 10 years old? Parts of his brain haven't matured properly, which is why they never see anything funny around them. They don't laugh. Mm -hmm. Whereas everyone else it can laugh at little jokes, like plays on words and things like that. They never do. It's funny you should say that, because I, I've actually had an experience. I was, I've, I'm actually a member of the, uh, J, the JREF forum, so I do occasionally go on to sceptic forums. I don't spend too much time there because it just drives me nuts. But um, yeah. um, I've got talking to a guy. Um, uh, my name is, is Porter. It's, it's Porter Boy, actually. It's my username on there yep. if you want to look yep. me up. Um, I got talking to a guy about... Um, I can't remember what it was, but I was talking about Darwinism and about evolution, the theory of evolution, about how... Yep. I said, well, it's obviously this is a kind of very, very important kind of... Um, it's a very... The theory actually has... It applies to... It can be applied to many, many things in life, such as the development of... Other things like languages, you know, the way languages descend from Latin yeah. and yeah. Celtic yeah. and Germanic and things like that. And it can be applied yeah. to other things like the development of memes, as, um, yes. as Susan Blackmore calls them, you know. And this guy, um, I mean, even Richard Dawkins has actually said this. He, he, he actually, you know, he did a speech at TAM London 20, 2010 saying he thinks evolution should become the new classics for that reason. Now, this guy I spoke to, just said, he just wrote back saying, Darwin's theory of evolution is, I don't understand what you're saying about it. Because it, it refers only to the development of biological life. And I thought to myself, yeah. he just doesn't get it. He no. was literally incapable of understanding the point I was making. Yes. Even, even, even though I don't necessarily agree that, um, you know, the theory yeah. of evolution is... I'm sure we were talking off air about how it needs a lot, of, a lot of biologists. If you ask them privately and anonymously, they'll say it does need some re-examination. Yes. You know, but the point I was making was I was trying to sort of like um, meet him halfway by explaining... How, a, a sort you of meta using, yeah. You made the mistake of using a metaphor. Yes, yeah. that's yeah. it. And they can't. Yeah. And he seemed to he eat this guy. He couldn't see that he's blind. Yep. yep. That's his problem. So, I'll tell you what literal-minded people do. They have photographic memories, and the first time they hear something, it is the truth. Yeah. So it's simple as this: if you say Darwinism does X, Y, Z, he'll always repeat for the rest of his life. 
because he's always going to have this literal mind. He's not going to mature. He's going to say, Darwinism does X, Y, Z. He mm. can't do any more, can't do any less. Because the first time he heard it becomes truth, physically sealed into his brain, because he's got the literal mind of a child. Yeah. Yeah. That's why they can overbelieve fairy tales like Santa Claus, because they're just too literal. I see. So they, they take on these they take on these fairy these stories as children and believe them literally. And then when Absolutely. when the rug is pulled under their feet and this literal this um, literal stru- you know, mental structure collapses, it's a very traumatic they experience. They are destroyed. Mm. I mean, I mean, if you want to look it up, I made two videos. I actually had a skeptic confess to me. His name was Emilio. I made two videos about it. So you just look at, go into my channel, yeah. type in Emilio, and you'll find a lengthy dissertation about he was traumatized by Santa Claus, but it took him two years to get over it. Well, I'll have, but, I mean, I've, I must have seen it because I've watched all your videos for the last year, I think, or at least. So. Oh, it's older than that. It's all older right. than that. Old. But I'll, Emilio is the key word. He's Emilio. a very erudite honest mm. person and he tells you a whole lot and he, he explains to you how the other thing about being literal minded and childish infantile under 12 before your maturation hormones kick in is that you sort of um what was it going to say then you you sort of believe everything you hear first time but you um what was it going to say then i lost it it's all right there's something else they do oh um i know what it is Emilio explains in the video, and you'll see it. Mm. He talks about, you think believing is easy. You all just believe things. He said, you can have such a fear of believing that you'll never believe anything ever again. And he's talking from the bottom of his heart while he's typing. And it's in those two videos. Mm. It's a robot talk video. It's just a text file made into a talk video. Yeah. But he actually says, it took him years to be able to believe something. Till he was twenty something, till he could just quietly believe something without being stressfully reminded of what happened when he was nine. Blimey, that, that is, this is a really interesting. This is something I've not. This is you're giving me information now I've never heard before, but it really is very, very interesting, and, and it then, ties in with it ties in very much with what people like um, Louis Sass and um, Ian McGilchrist have said about the, the fact that um, you know you, that their their views about schizophrenia and about how it's. Um, it can be yeah, the extremity yeah. of logic rather than a lack, of, rather than the destruction of logic. It's actually the extremity yeah, yeah. of logic without anything else, without any metaphor. Yes. So, mm. can you see how a person with a literal mind who believes whatever they hear the first time to be the truth, and it becomes embedded in their in their mind and can't be removed? It's a physical imprint. Mm. Uh, how do you think they would see other people connecting islands of thought? With meta, meta what with metaphorical connections. I mean, you're connecting islands of metaphor, being mm. connected with seemingly crazy logic, which makes a lot of sense to a grown-up person, like you yeah. were doing, trying to explain something, and he's going, he's totally gaga, because he's got yeah. this literal mind. And um, mm. you see, what what metaphorical thinkers can do, they can think of eight things at once. They can put on a board and think, uh, Darwinism, languages, English, culture. Uh, all sorts of things, and you can just you just put them on a board and you run through them in your mind because you put a blackboard in your mind, right? Yeah. And I seriously question whether they have the same mind's eye that we do. Yeah. As I seriously question that. And so that, something yeah. that's greatly missing, and I and he told me this, and I I got I cottoned on to it, and he said you're quite right when you say grown up people have a too hard basket, and. <laughs> Yeah. Literal minded people don't have one. Yeah. And they're obsessed with I cannot be wrong, I must be right. Yeah. So if you encounter somebody who is yeah. thinking in a in a more mature way in that sense is is expanding their mind into areas such as intuition yeah. and, and yeah. E- or even you know, things that contradict these the, the logic yeah. of the, the obsessive logic, they they can actually find those kind of people quite uncomfortable to be around. Yeah. And they're yeah. their very presence. All right. Well, so so I made a few videos about this. And, and what happens is, as simple as this, if you come across, say you see another paranormal event mm. going somewhere tomorrow, you'll say, well, I can't explain all of that. I don't know how it happened this way or that way. And uh, was it because I was eating chips or was it because somebody else was involved or what? The full explanation, you don't know. So you'll put the whole event in what you might call the too hard basket. Now, that's a metaphorical concept, yeah. which is beyond the literal-minded skeptics. 
And because they are obsessed with understanding everything, nothing can happen until they understand it. That's another defect they have in their thinking. Yeah. Because they don't have this too hard basket where you say, I really don't know how a flying saucer could appear there in that forest. Yeah. Um, I'll just put it in my too hard basket. They don't have the metaphorical concept. They never grow into it. Yeah. It's either sewn up completely in their minds or it's it's epiphenomenal. It doesn't exist. Yes. That's this it's, 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 it's either one or the other. Yeah. I see. Yes. Mm. Black and white thinking. Whereas you can happily live with eleven shades of grey. Yeah. That's it. And happily take two out when someone tells you you know, ten years time you go, Oh, I can take out three shades of grey now, I've got a rough idea. I'm getting there. Mm. Another twenty years and I'll find out the full explanation for the paranormal phenomena if I'm lucky. Yeah. And you'll happily go along with that all your life. And hmm. people remember paranormal things for decades, are happy to do that, happy to live with it. Yeah, live with the ability to live with uncertainty, that's right. And, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's in, yeah, it's, I think there's hope for Chris French, actually, because I think he's mellowed in recent years, and if he can take a joke, yeah. that's a good sign. And But... Um, that's so he obviously he if he can if he has a sense of humour then maybe he's making progress you know. Yes. So Steve, and um, we're going we've run out of time I'm afraid, but before we go, I, just tell us. Um, so you have, just tell the listeners and remind the listeners you have a YouTube channel and um, you have a website. You tell us what they are. Yes. yes. Uh, the YouTube channel is Kimbo ninety nine, and I do two things. That's K I M K I M B O ninety nine, all one word, yeah. And uh, I do two things. Mm. I do advanced an analysis of skeptics. I've made about 100 videos on the skeptic mindset mm. and the damage they do to society. And I'm also a gnosis teacher, which means I'll tingle your hands in 20 minutes and give you physical evidence of the divine spark within you and encourage it to come out and play inside your internal awareness. And you'll get vivid messaging dreams in um, about seven days. Right. So that's, and you have a website called truebluehealer.com. That's it. Right. Well, this has been. I do really recommend it, especially the Kimbo ninety nine web channel. I do recommend going there and subscribing and going through the, the videos because they're really, really. Anyone who's had any problems with skeptics and not been able to sort of like articulate it, this guy really has. He's really analysed them thoroughly. Well, um, Steve Trueblue, thank you very much for being a guest on Hapanwo Radio. We'll have you back sometime. It'd be great to have you back. Wonderful. Okay. Enjoyed being here. Enjoyed Good. being with you very much. Oh, thank you very much, mate. All right, see you then. Okay, ta-ta. Hospital, Hospital Port, Port of Pride, Pride and Dignity. And dignity. Stop, Stop the New the World, World Order. Order. Welcome, Welcome to, to Panwo Radio. Radio. And uh, we're coming up to the end of Programme 21 now, and I want to thank everyone for listening at CMR and everyone else around the world for tuning in. And also special thanks to Reverend George of The Prisoner Show, who created that wonderful jingle. And he also helped me out with that, pre that uh, Chris French uh, sketch as well, which you heard earlier on. Uh, Paul and Andy are up next with The Unpenned Show. And at 11pm this evening, we have a new recruit to the Tuesday night team. Yes, Chris Bovey of The Tottenham's Hemp Show. Yeah, he used to be on Saturday night, but now he's been moved to the Tuesday night crew. So, uh, welcome, Chris. I hope listeners will stay tuned for that. It's a wonderful evening on Critical Mass Radio. Now, um, this has definitely been a happy show, I think. So, uh, we're going to stomp out tonight with a happy song. It's called Tub Thumper by Chumba Womba. And they're a really good band, and they performed this song in 1998 at the Brit Awards, during which they threw a cup of water over... Tony Blair's Deputy Prime Minister John Prescott and I say well done guys but you really should have used sour milk or something so enjoy the rest of your evening on Critical Mass Radio good night and God bless <laughs>